Accessible Gaming, the Alley Cats Game, a reverent, reverent adventure in accessibility. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, DQ and ISU, uh, for giving us this time to talk about it. So I'm going to introduce the concept of Alley Cats um, because it's something that is near and dear to my heart as the originator of the idea. And I wanted to tell you a little bit of history about that, where it all started. And I'll be passing that over to Brittany and Cindy to continue the conversation. So go to the next slide. There you go. So there's a lot of text on the screen. So I will kind of quickly uh, talk about what it is. But back in early 2018, I literally had a dream about alley cats, about a bunch of cats. And there were eight bit characters, and they were running around in my dream. And I brought this idea back to a group of, of us. Uh, we called ourselves the Alley Cats. That was Eric Bailey, uh, Zoe Bell, Scott O'Hara, Sarah Tabor, Scott Vinkel. And I said, hey, I had this really weird dream. Uh, should I make a shirt out of it? <laughs> and they, being the very supportive people that they are, said, go for it. Uh, and so with their feedback, over time, we created this design called the Alley Cats. And uh, Alley, if you aren't familiar, is the shorthand for accessibility. So it's A, and then there's 11 letters and Y. So it's a play on words. In English, Alley Cat is also a concept of a, um, a cat that may be out, uh, you know, hanging out in the street, but also the concept that Alley is we are uh, alleys of people uh, with disabilities. Um, and on the community as well. So it's kind of a multiple uh, layers. So we made this shirt. Uh, we had uh, some really great reception. Uh, people loved it. They bought it. And we were super fortunate to be able to donate um, to different initiatives. And they're posted on the screen. It won't take up all the time. But we have all, all the numbers and all the things. And now we still produce the shirts, but we um, are giving it now to Accessibility Talks. That's another organization that I'm a part of. If you haven't checked them out, uh, we have a website and a YouTube channel. And we are, as of late last year, an official nonprofit. So we've been using that those monies or we're going to be using those monies going forward. Um, there you go. So that's kind of the back end story. And I wanted to give a shout out to everyone. So Ali Techs really brought me over to this team where I'm gonna hand off to Brittany. Um, but I just wanted to say that without Ali Talks, I would have never met Brittany. I would have never met Cindy. I might not have even started my PhD uh, in HCI. So I'm very fortunate and thankful uh, that everyone loved it. Thank you, Carrie. So building off of the history of Alley Cats that Carrie kind of introduced us to, um, we started the process of designing a game. And I'm going to talk a little bit about who is doing it. So we have a digital accessibility lab set up at our university that opened in 2019. The funds for our lab came from student technology fees, where students voted to have $25,000 allocated for the startup of the lab. And our work involves creating and reviewing websites, apps, games, course materials, and other digital products. And our work is also supported through collaborative grants with faculty. We provide guidance, uh, support, and consultation to units throughout campus to enable uh, the adoption of accessibility-minded practices. So our specific team, we have a very diverse team of accessibility professionals and students. So right now we have four undergraduate students, uh, two graduate students, and two full-time staff members. And the team has lots of different lived experiences, uh, areas of expertise and responsibilities in the lab and on different projects that we're working on. And our team also has people with disabilities and people without disabilities, as well as folks who hold various other identities. So the team embraces the disability co community mantra, nothing about us without us, which directly correlates to our efforts with building the Alley Cats game. So I will give it to Cindy to talk a little bit more about building the actual game. 
All right, thank you, Brittany, and thank you, Carrie. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Alley Cats game and irreverent, reverent adventure and accessibility. I've been practicing saying that 10 times in a row really fast <laughs> in preparation for today. So we started the process of designing this game shortly after our digital accessibility lab opened. And in early 2020, then the COVID shut some things down for a bit as y'all have probably experienced. We moved uh, to remote work pretty quickly uh, at Iowa State University. And for students that were working on the team that offered a new set of challenges for them and for us um, who were working full-time as well. So most of the team are student workers and had to adjust both to online learning. Um, we shifted our academic calendar um, and also switched to fully remote work, which as a student, that made it a little, little challenging for, for everybody. So this new strange time heightened our attention to inaccessible online courses, Zoom meetings, recorded lecture videos without captioning, and the increased disparity for those who experience disabilities on our campus. Taking all these factors into account from our daily lives, we wanted to create a game that would be geared towards students, faculty, and staff to bring awareness of different situations that contribute to disability. And the Alley Cats game was born. It's in this serious game genre, meaning we are focused on building knowledge and attitudes and not strictly for entertainment only. So one of the team members, um, is a full-time employee in another department and we borrowed her and her artistic skills. Um, and so she drew a bunch of cats and all of the cats are representations of actual cats living or non-living anymore. Um, and so on this slide, we have sketches for the different alley cats. Um, and then the mean looking cat who's not actually mean is chicken and she's one of my one of my kitty cats coming to life in the game. So when designing a game with accessibility in mind from the beginning, we started with a game design document that has become a living document through our iterative design process, meaning we make changes along the way, depending on the research and data that we gather. We knew we wanted to focus on digital accessibility and accessible gaming. On the slide, there are two pictures. The one on the left side is our Xbox with adaptive controller and switch controls. The picture on the right is a student researcher working with the adaptive controllers. We started our research with the lab's Xbox and adaptive controller, along with the Logitech kit of switch controls, and we deconstructed several games. At the same time, we researched disability and gaming, found some great resources like Able Gamers, One Switch, Can I Play That blog, and found folks to follow on Twitter, Twitch, and Discord. We read several academic papers and conference presentations, attended the Games for Change Festival, the Game Developers Conference and the Game Accessibility Conference. The Xbox Accessibility Guidelines um, were very helpful in aligning the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines success criteria to game development. Not everybody on our team is a gamer. Some of us are and some of us are not. So we needed to level up our knowledge. Through our collective research, we distilled our knowledge into a few basic needs for our game. Three of these are the ability for the player to remap controls to be able to customize from a typical controller to switch controls for adaptive gaming. Also to be able to change color contrast um, and toggle on or off closed captioning and subtitles. We worked on several platforms, including VR with an Oculus, 
the Xbox, a desktop computer on um, which is our dedicated gaming computer, mainly through the Steam platform. We worked on a PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, and an Atari 2600. Um, and more than 90% of the games we deconstructed and analyzed did not have one or more of the considerations for accessibility that we think need to be included. So we paid special attention when um, The Last of Us Part Two, that game came out and it's groundbreaking attention to accessibility and ability for players to customize. Another part of our research was to look for what was missing. Several games we played had some characters with disabilities or disability accoutrements, like in Animal Crossing New Horizons, you could purchase a wheelchair in the store, but it was merely decorative decorative like a lawn chair. So I think I bought like 30 of them to have all around my island and they were just sitting around. As far as characters with disabilities, they were almost always non-playable characters or NPCs. We noticed that NPCs were also prevalent for other types of diversity like race and queerness. Our team collectively and intentionally wanted to focus on humor safe for work <laughs> humor to talk about disability through gameplay. It is a serious subject, accessibility, and needs to be. And many folks that we talked to were very uncomfortable even mentioning disability. These are people on our campus. They didn't know what etiquette to use and did not want to get it wrong and offend someone. And this led us to our next phase in the game design and development process with user experience and I will hand it back to Brittany. Thank you, Cindy. So um, after designing the initial ideas and concept for the game, implementing the accessibility research that Cindy just touched on and getting the basics programmed, it is time to start on the user experience research. Uh, the fun part, the more fun part. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so for our research, the first thing that we had to do was get IRB approval. So the IRB, or the Institutional Review Board, is a federally mandated committee whose main purpose is to ensure that the rights and well-being of human subjects uh, during research are protected. So um, all human subjects research conducted by folks at Iowa State need to have IRB approval or exemption prior to starting the actual research activities. And the research remains under IRB oversight until all of the research activities are wrapped up. So our specific IRB approved study was considered exempt because it only includes uh, interactions involving survey and interview procedures. And it's not anticipated that the research will place the participants at a high risk of harm. And overall, it's important to get IRB approval uh, because we are a university with a heavy focus on research. Um, the IRB approval is required when there are plans to publish your research, which we do intend to do. And most importantly, going through the IRB ensures that when you're doing research with human subjects, they're not presented with high risks of harm um, and they're protected while participating. So why do we want to even do research in the first place? Uh, user experience research is essential because it provides a baseline for our design strategy and informs our game design and decisions. It helps us create the best possible and gaming product. Uh, research is the only true way we can really know the problems that participants will experience when playing our game and it will allow us to find solutions while also fully understanding the scope of the participants' needs. And the ultimate goal is to find design opportunities and really refine the game as we go until we have a final solution that eliminates the problems and takes into consideration the experiences and feedback that we gathered from the research. 
And it's especially important when creating a game focused on disabilities and accessibility because we want our final product to be based on data and to avoid assumptions. And with research, we will have this data to back up our process and design decisions. So with our research, we want to use a participatory approach and really stay true to the disability community's mantra, nothing about us without us, to ensure that we're really talking to people with disabilities, um, as well as those without disabilities, to find out their thoughts and overall experiences. We want to prioritize working to understand disabilities and how people interact with their technology while playing our game and doing our research overall will help us prioritize um, designing with assistive technologies in mind including people with disabilities in all stages of the design development and research process so we centered our research around four main questions um, question one is how do people with disabilities want to be represented in the game Question two is what outcomes do people expect from playing the game? Question three, are user personas helpful in developing the Alley Cats game? And question four, does the game fit into the higher education curriculum? So in order to do the research, we were going to take a qualitative research approach to really deeply learn from the experiences of participants, including folks with disabilities, about their thoughts, uh, feelings, and experiences, and their different reasonings behind them. So we have two main phases of our data gathering process. Phase one, which is an online survey, and phase two, which are semi-structured uh, personal interviews. So students over the age of 18 attending Iowa State will be included in our study. Um, this is the age group, which we are designing the game for. And it's important to note that we will be including both people with disabilities and people without disabilities. And at no point in time um, will people be forced to disclose their disability status, but they can self-disclose if they would like to. So let's see, phase one, which is the survey. Uh, during phase one of the research, an online survey will be administered and sent as a mass email to the Iowa State students who are 18 and older. And survey questions will be focused on understanding the needs, challenges, experiences, and opportunities related to disability representation and gaming, perceptions of disability characters in the game, uh, accessibility preferences and needs within the game, what is considered a successful outcome while playing the game, and truly just how people with disabilities wish to be represented in a game focused on disabilities, as well as gathering general interest and feedback on the gaming concept, uh, user interface design, and aesthetics of the different game screens. And then phase two of our research will be semi-structured individual interviews with students who uh, self-identify as having a disability and also students who identify as not having a disability. And the interviews will be focused on play testing the game. And this is the opportunity to really dive deeper into the participants' feelings, thoughts, opinions, um, and observations and the data we kind of gained from the phase one survey and participants will be asked to complete specific tasks while playing the game and speak aloud the thoughts that they're having while they're playing and interacting with different elements. And the overall goal of the phase two interviews and play testing will be to identify problems in the game's design, uncover opportunities to improve the game, uh, learn about the player's behavior and preferences, have participants rate their opinions of the different features of the game, gain insight into the ease of learning, 
identify any problems with navigation and usability issues, and also um, gain insight into accessibility features we built into the game. So this feedback gathered from the phase two interviews will be compiled to make updates to the future iterations of the game and inform design decisions throughout the other levels that we will be building. And then I will let Cindy talk a little bit more about playtesting. All right, thank you, Brittany. So playtesting is one of the more fun pieces of the game design process. And we are doing it as a further exercise of designing with instead of designing for people. And this is super important. Um, we want to make sure that our focus will be on evaluating the game's user interface elements. Um, they will complete time on task activities and play the game to establish its playability. The activities that we will observe include the use of the game on a desktop computer, interaction with the game interface elements, time on task, meaning how long does it take them to complete uh, something within the game or find something within the game and the, just the general playability of the game. There will be multiple tasks designed to follow for some A-B testing, comparing various UI components of the game as well. Some of the sample tasks that we have come up with include opening the settings menu, turning on a colorblind mode, pausing the game, and adding time to a level timer. UI elements will be tested and participants will be asked their opinions on the design and interface display aspects of the game, such as avatars, the colors, fonts, any widgets. Um, uh, basically, their expectations about what a control does and any accessibility barriers that they might encounter. We want to pay special attention to that. Um, functionality and physical load. Uh, so physical navigation aspects of the game. What does it take um, for people? And um, moving the avatars, button clicks, time spent navigating um, to other areas in the game, any other physical gestures that are required to play, any control locations and use, um, and any physical accessibility barriers. So um, there is a learning experience and cognitive load that we want to measure as well. We want to figure out how to play and interact with uh, the game through onboarding and creating mental plans on how to continue through the game uh, or task, remembering what to press for specific ac actions, remembering game objectives and goals, and how to just basically move around within the game. So data collection instruments for us will include both uh, performance data and preference data. Performance data will include the number of errors made during any specific task, um, any percentage of tasks completed successfully, uh, number of omitted steps or procedures, frequency of any requests for help, and in general, the time to complete a certain task. Preference data will include our A-B testing of the UI elements and wireframes that we're working on suggestions from the participants that we are interviewing for improving the game. Um, if there's any negative references to the game and then rationales for performance, why did participants do what they did? And then um, any ratings or rankings of the game, whether each task was completed successfully, whether prompting or players required assistance, major problems or obstacles associated with each task. So basically observing people using the game. So for some reason, also my camera has stopped working. So that's a fun um, 
tech fail on my end, <laughs> so I apologize for that. So what's next for us in the game? So if you happen to be working at a game development um, studio and you're like, oh, this is nice to be able to do all this research and spend time doing all this, uh, that's sort of a luxury that we have being in an academic setting is that we, we have time to research uh, and also we can figure out where we can speed up the process um, so it could apply to industry at some point. So what we are doing next within our group, um, we are focusing on finishing up our research this semester. We're <laughs> working in semesters, so by mid-May we'll be done with our research. Game development takes time, and what we hope is that by the time AxCon rolls around next year, we'll have a full game. Um, so following the research, the game will continuously be modified as necessary to include the findings from our research data, but also from players um, having it out there. So we hope to head off most of those errors, if we can, ahead of time. Uh, we'll have a report um, that details our findings, including the need for further disability representation in games in general and our own process of including disability representation in all phases of game design and development and also research. That is what we have officially. Um, I'm gonna try and get my camera working again, but now we can open it up for Q&A. Great. We've had some excellent questions coming through so far, but just a nudge to our audience. If you have more questions, please feel free to put them through in the Q&A section. But we'll start with, um, what does each cat represent disability-wise? Carrie, I'm going to throw that back to you for the original alley cats. We modeled it after the original ones. So. Yeah, thanks, Cindy, <laughs> for that. No, and I think our new characters have kind of taken on different characteristics, and I'm sure Cindy and Brittany will want to talk about those as well. But originally, and I probably shouldn't have said that in the history, so not only, you know, is Alley Cats a play on word and it's linked to accessibility, the idea was that we're representing all types of dis disabilities within the shirt design. Um, and so each character has a disability. There's actually only one in my mind that does not. Um, so there's hidden disabilities and there are um, disabilities that um, hidden and uh, maybe not as obvious if you just looked at somebody and you communicated with them, maybe you would know. So in my mind, I have very specific ones. Other ones are temporary disabilities and there's other ones that are obvious that, um, you know, is in a wheelchair or hearing aid. So you could deaf or hard of hearing or a motor disability. So some of those are a little bit more visually obvious, but the concept is, is that I didn't want, and I'd said this even to Cindy and Brittany, I didn't want to give them those kinds of identities because I wanted everyone to be able to see themselves within that design and feel represented in that design and part of the accessibility community. So that's, that's my long answer saying, um, I've got my own interpretation and I, I appreciate if you have your own as well. I love that. So there's been a lot of enthusiasm in the Q&A uh, for ways to get involved, some interest if there is a way to get involved as a tester or a how to be able to follow your work that you are doing. So we'd love to open that up to you all. How can, how can folks listening in today get involved or follow your work? Yeah, thanks. That's awesome. Um, so uh, since we're at Iowa State University, um, our email addresses are uh, available. Um, we put them on the screen and we can put them in the chat as well. So you have them all spelled out. Um, we do have uh, a YouTube channel through Iowa State University's Information Technology Services where we are working on some of our um, other assistive tech that's in our digital accessibility lab. And that's where you can follow the, some of the most up-to-date things that we're working on. Um, 
Oh, Carrie and I are both on Twitter. That's how I, I met Carrie. Actually, was on Twitter. I was like, "Hey, your alley cats are cool. Can <laughs> can we partner on them?" Um, and yeah, the rest is history. And then um, um, Brittany and I, being full time staff uh, at Iowa State, participate on our um, Iowa State social media channels. So we have a all of them, but the TikTok. Uh, we're trying to get that going at ISU. I think we will. So hopefully soon <laughs> we'll uh, have more information um, to spread through throughout social media of play testing and such. Would love to um, have other people's input outside of the university. For the research part, we have to keep within the university because that's how we wrote our, <laughs> our IRB research protocols. But that doesn't mean that later we can't share some fun things to play. And that actually goes right into another question that was sent. How has the IRB standards of low risk of harm evolved during COVID and did that affect your team at all? Brittany, you have any insight on that one? I don't know if I have specific insight on how they've evolved. Um, I don't know how they've changed just particularly due to COVID. There's probably documentation <laughs> online, I would guess, uh, with the differences, but I personally do, do not know uh, the answer to that. So when, um, when the university first um, moved to remote learning we also moved to remote researching <laughs> as well and so we were everybody was trying to figure it out as we went along so a lot of the research that was happening with you know like participants coming into a lab um, for us and interviewing them we had to stop all in-person activities uh, so we we decided to put our research on hold rather than trying to come up with the, a remote way um, to do it. We could have done it remotely, but it's just, for us, it's not as authentic as we needed it to be. Um, so some researchers uh, with IR, their IRB uh, research um, could switch um, from in-person to something else if they needed to, if they filled out a form <laughs> of um, like altering their research protocols and getting that on file. So um, now that we are back uh, in person, we were in a hybrid format. We're still kind of hybrid. Uh, we work uh, in a hybrid f format just in general, but um, being able to do in-person research is exciting. And this is the first time since uh, COVID that we will have pick that up again. So we just put it on hold for ourselves. Absolutely. It makes sense. Um, another question that was coming through was regarding if you all are partnering or consulting with any game companies for your research and development. Not partnering specifically, um, but um, all three of us, um, Carrie, Brittany, and I are part of the Teach Access um, group organization. And if you're not familiar with Teach Access, it's a nonprofit. It's a mixture of institutions, academic um, colleges, community colleges, um, and industry companies, and also advocacy organizations. Um, so we've kind of been talking about Al the Alley Cats games because it's fun to talk about. So um, yeah, we haven't officially partnered with anybody. Um, yeah, so just kind of, you know, mentioning it around and hoping, you know, when we publish our research, then things will be public um, and shareable. Great. So another question came through around games like Forza, Halo, and Sea of Thieves, where players can represent themselves uh, with prosthetic body parts, for example. What's your take on that? Yeah, so I'm really interested in that uh, because those are games uh, with Sea of Thieves a, a bit newer. Um, so... 
I think it, you know, it really comes down to, to listening to each individual person and how they want to represent themselves. I know we're not going to get it hundred percent right all the time. We can't, um, we'll do our best to meet a lot of wants and needs, um, and honor the folks that are participating with us. But I, <laughs> yeah, I, I live in uh, reality and also, you know, some people, will like that and some people won't like that. So it, it's definitely on a list for us to, to deconstruct and analyze by playing. So it'll be someone's task to play through Sea of Thieves and they are working on that in our lab. And then just kind of asking people, reading you know, blog posts and opinions is really helpful um, as well. It's a new take on um, disability representation. It's in a different context. So I'm excited about the possibility. It's definitely opened up um, non, non-playable characters to being a playable character. So we'll have to see. A fun research task for someone to take on to play through those. Great. So shifting topics a little bit, I know it was really critical to you all when you were building your team to center diversity and inclusion. Can you talk a little bit about the practices that you put in place to develop and maintain an inclusive team? Absolutely. Um, So uh, the digital accessibility program started at Iowa State about five years ago. and I have been the digital accessibility lead for three years and it was just me for a bit. And working in IT was a shift (laughs) for me. Um, I wasn't used to being in an IT department. I was a professor of art and design. Um, I was teaching graphic design and game design and UX. And um, I noticed when I was in meetings that I was often the only non-male person in the room. And um, so when we were able to get the original $25,000 to start the lab, that enabled us to hire um, some people. And I really wanted to pay special attention to um, after school, after college, um, the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is way higher than just the standard rate. And I wanted to make sure that we paid people fairly for their work, paid students fairly for their work and their input. Um, So if people are participating in the study, um, we will um, compensate them for their time and their expertise, but also people that are working in the lab need to be compensated as well and set up the dynamic of what they offer, um, the work that they do, of course, but also just who they are is important as well. So um, just a couple of simple things that we did in hiring was to put our diversity, equity, and inclusion information near the top of the job listing instead of at the bottom as a boilerplate. Um, I didn't want to treat it as an afterthought. Uh, And also including in that Um, encouraging people with disabilities to apply. And again, not just saying, yeah, people with disabilities apply. Um, And then, you know, hoping that we live up to that within our department and we're working on some things to increase um, accessibility within our building on campus. So there's a lot of physical accessibility that meets the minimum standards for ADA compliance, but it's not great. And so having leadership buy in to doing better than what we have been has been really important to in advocating for that. So um, we're paying one of the highest amounts on campus for student workers, which I am super excited about at that students who are working in the lab, deconstructing games um, and creative writing, you know, writing some of the narrative and coding, um, they're paid at the same level and they're paid at the same level as uh, people who are working, the students that are working in uh, development in, in our web dev department. And there was a previous disparity in that rate and I didn't want that disparity. So I advocated to have have it be at the same pay 
Um, but also you have to have leadership buy-in to get, get them to approve those things. And so we're very, very lucky to be in a position where um, we're being listened to and it's really nice. And they let us do this game, which is <laughs> super fantastic as well. Brittany, did you have anything to add to the DEI aspect? Uh, I don't think so. I think just echoing everything you said and just really placing an emphasis on um, trying to recruit people to join our team from all sorts of backgrounds and um, trying to convey to them that we value diversity and inclusion with everything we're working on. So outside of the game, but all the other projects that we have going on as well. So um, just kind of always being, you know, attentive to the team's needs and being hearing their voices and trying to make things better little by little, I'd say, is, is what we're trying to do. Piggybacking on this a little bit, if you were to think ahead to your hopes and dreams for the impact that the Digital Accessibility Lab will have on Iowa State culture overall, what would that be? Yeah, so we know that we need a cultural shift um, just in general for diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in terms of including accessibility in with diversity, uh, but also uh, we're in the Midwest. So our physical location, we're in Iowa, we're in the middle of Iowa, we're in the Midwest. I grew up in the Midwest. Um, a lot of us actually have uh, who are on the team have been around the Midwest. So inviting people who aren't from the Midwest or even from the US to add to our team and our diversity. And so the lab, what I hope is that we contribute to this larger cultural shift that um, I, I see beginning to happen, that needs to happen, um, that maybe you know other, other schools uh, in different locations are doing a better job than we are right now. And I hope to catch up. <laughs> I really do. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's fun to see where it takes Iowa State, but really to go beyond Iowa State as well. And, you know, talk with all you folks and see what happens with, you know, not only the game, but just digital accessibility. Um, and someone said to me recently, uh, is actually on, on a, one of the teach access uh, meetings that we had that, you know, accessibility and disability is just, it's not the, the shiny bling bling stuff that Silicon Valley, you know, has historically paid attention to. And I think there's a lot of companies doing a lot of good things, a lot of good forward progress. Um, and so the game for me, it's fun. I have played games for a long time in my life and enjoyed them and used them as escapism from some of the other things that were happening socially and personally. Um, and it can be seen as the shiny bling bling. And I'm kind of okay with that because if that brings attention to accessibility and digital accessibility and DEI, um, then okay, we can be the shiny thing. Absolutely. Anything you would add, Brittany or Carrie? I think Cindy said it very well <laughs> again. Um, but I would just add just remembering that our impact and what we're doing now is kind of just a starting point and um, culture shift takes a long time. So uh, just trying to keep up the good fight every day and um, you know, making a difference where we can and impacting not only campus, but outside campus as well. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay. Another question came through regarding ally features in video gaming. And a common complaint is often that this can enable cheating. Have you encountered these complaints before and what would be your response to them? well, off the cuff, get over it. It's not cheating, but you know, we're not in the esports market. So, <laughs> um, so for instance, in the last of us part two, um, I turned on the high contrast mode so that I could essentially cheat 
and loot all of the rooms uh, and make sure I got every single thing out of every place I was visiting. And uh, so a lot of people consider that a cheat because I don't necessarily need a high contrast mode with how my vision is, but I turned it on to yes, get an advantage of looting all the rooms and getting all the stuff. Um, but it's also been a complaint of mine that part of my disability is not, <laughs> so fun to say that this way, not looting <laughs> completely enough. And so the high contrast mode was fantastic because I'm like, ah, I can finally do this. Um, so uh, yeah, so I hear that argument a lot. I hear that argument from both people in the disability, disability community and outside of the disability community. Um, and there is a difference between esports and competitive uh, play versus um, other types of, of playing. Um, I play um, Overwatch uh, is my, my main game. And so for competition, there's certain things that you can and, and can't do um, and types of controllers that you can and can't have. And that's an area where I would like to see more inclusion and more accessibility. Um, and it just hasn't happened yet, but I think it will. Um, I follow a person um, that goes by Broly Legs, a uh, Street Fighter competitive esports gamer. Um, very good, has been professional for a long time, has disabilities, and goes really far in competition. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I <laughs> the word cheating, like for us in the academic institution means one thing and then like, you know, a game cheat can mean another thing. So if I get stuck in a game, I'm gonna go to Discord or watch Twitch to see how other people get unstuck and that could be considered a, a cheat as well. Um, yeah, so it's there. And I think accessibility features need to be there. Um, yeah, that's all, I'm, <laughs> that's all I can say about it. Carrie, Brittany, any different takes there? Great, so we probably have time for just one question. So I'll end it with kind of a fun one. Um, is there a cat that you most resonate with? I, I want to go first because <laughs> part of the stipulation, and I'm joking about that, but when Cindy first approached me and said, hey, can I borrow your cats for this really cool project? I was like, yes, have at it. Only include my cat, Lemur. So Lemur is represented in the game and will be represented. So um, Lemur unfortunately passed, but I feel that she'll live on through uh, Cindy and, and Brittany's game, so, and the lab's game, so very excited about that. I do not have much knowledge about different cats, um, so, like, <laughs> I can say which cat in our specific game I would relate most to, but I guess outside of the game, um, a fluffy one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the different types, but um, I would say the cat in the game that is a mobility aid user, a wheelchair user that we have. Um, that is the one that I would pick. That's Lemur. I know. <laughs> she votes for Lemur. Cindy, I'll let you round us out. Do you have a cat that you most resonate with from the game? Um, it, yeah, it's, it's probably Chicken, who is in one of the first um, slides. She's um, not hairless, but a Cornish Rex um, and ha has just really expressive features. She has an invisible disability, so I resonate the most with that. And some of the students uh, have a character called Dr. Meowface, which is my gamer tag. <laughs> so that's like, <laughs> I'm kind of eager to see how that turns out, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, we are at time, but just a tremendous thank you to all of you. Um, this has been really informative and really appreciate your time today.